and that is where my nomination came. So I am saying life has come a full circle for me so far as the IFRS implementation is concerned. And no one is involved with it, but I can dare say that today whatever work we did in the earlier year, that is coming very handy because now what we have to change is only the changes which have been affected by the IESB to those standards and that we have already done if you really ask me. But certain new standards on agriculture because we didn't have any standard on agriculture. We didn't have any standard so far as the financial instruments was concerned. Earlier there was IS 13, but we didn't have any standard so equivalent to that. We did come up with the standard 30, 31, 32 in our case, but then the government didn't notify it. So we do not have any standard equivalent to IS 39, but now it is IFRS 9 for that matter. And the IESB has said that we will implement it effective one for 2017. Now one of the argument which is coming from the industry to us is that if IESB is going to implement IFRS 9 effective one for 2017, where is the hurry that you should implement it immediately? Now our argument is very simple as the chairman Nakas and as Nakas that we do not have any standard right now on the financial instruments and it has its own linkages at various places. You need to have a standard on the financial instruments, otherwise how do you govern and how do you really look at the compliance uh, aspects thereof. I am starting on this particular note because I know already question has not raised in the parliament anywhere because all these groups will become active again, that is not an issue. But when I talk of compliance through the governance, very frankly, I can start on certain notes and then I will really deal with the topic because I to me some of the things have been very, very passionate in my life. Because when I say of compliance through governance and governance, I, to me it is a DCR concept if you really ask me. The governance, then the risk, GRC concept, the risk assessment, the identification, the uh, mitigation and of course then the compliance is there to ensure that the governance does take a back seat in any of the companies. Because what, has, what we have seen in the recent times is, it is not governance, it has been misgovernance in most of the cases, if you really ask. If I have to ask a simple question to you all, and to me it is not accounting standards existence which is important. I am again repeating that, and I have said it at many, many forums. Because when this uh, 2007 thing happened in the world over, everybody was talking of one thing, and that was that accounting standards have to be blamed for it. Uh, blame for it. And I was asking how do you blame the accounting standards? Accounting standards are not to be blamed, it is the implementation, it is the non-compliance which is to be blamed for it for that matter. And the other aspects which have to be blamed for it. If one has to raise simple issue that in one of the listed companies in India today, a note by the management, only note, it is not in the, in the auditor's qualification, let me put it that way. A note by the management says that we have not provided for the interest on the borrowings from the banks because the banks have treated our account as a non-performing account. Can you beat it? Can you beat it? If the management says, and it is a huge liability if you ask me, and it goes on to say that we have not provided for this particular interest because the account became non-performing because you didn't pay either interest or the capital. And the bank was not supposed to recognize that particular interest and was supposed to say that it is a non-performing account because of the prudential norms. So bank was un duty bound and by the regulation, by the regulator, but you were duty bound under the contract to pay the interest or the capital uh, or, the, or the borrowing. You didn't pay and now you say that will not provide for the interest. And it does not draw even a comment by the auditor. Another Gujarat company today saying anything about Gujarat is very risky if you ask me. <laughs> but I, I think I have been in the habit of taking chances or risks for that matter because I have been able to mitigate some of the risks also in the life. So the other, this particular company says they have created a defer tax asset of about 62 crore rupees. I am talking of the standards because whether it is Indian standard or it is the IFRS. I, I think to me everything remains the same when it comes to the basic principle. Now this deferred tax asset has been created in respect of an unabsorbed depreciation and the carried forward business losses. And you go to the director's report immediately 
and the director's report starts with one fact and it says the future outlook of the business is gloomy. The government policies are against the industry. The company is likely to continue to incur losses. And we create a deferred asset of 62 crore rupees and take credit to the profit and loss account. I think most ridiculous. It is here probably the governance issues come in. To me, nothing can be more important and nothing can be more baffling than these two of the examples. Now, when uh, we were in the council, one of the scams, two of the scams which happened in the country. Of course, when one entered the council, Enron happened. It has no linkages with me. Let me be very clear about it. Not that one has been responsible for it. Worldcom happened. Parmalath happened, Xerox happened, then in India Satyam happened, GTB happened. Now if someone has to ask the significance of these compliances through the governance, why did Satyam happen? Can anyone of you really answer this question? Why did Satyam happen? Because everybody blames only the auditor, the poor auditor. Nobody is willing to blame someone else. Because after Satyam, the entire Companies Act has undergone a change, looking at the entire act from the viewpoint of Satyam. And the kind of responsibilities, the kind of uh, liabilities which have been fixed upon the auditors is absolutely, I can say, mind-blowing. And one cannot even think of whether the auditing profession should remain in India or should not remain in India. The auditors will become extinct in India if the kind of penalties, the kind of prosecutions which have been prescribed in the entire act. If the audit committee chairman, who happened to be at that particular time in Satyam, was the dean of ISB, International School of Business Studies, he happened to be the dean of that particular company, uh, he happened to be the uh, chairman of the audit committee of that particular company. If he could not raise one particular issue, why every year there is a jump in the current account balance of the company from three, about 1600 crore to 1900 crore to 2100 crore rupees. I have a very pertinent point. Why I am using the word current account? Because current account is one account on which you don't earn any interest. After all, as a chairman of the audit committee, I am supposed to see what is going to happen to the profitability of the company. If 2100 crore rupees is lying in a current account which is non-interest yielding, and every year this balance is jumping, I think the chairman audit committee should have addressed the issue, please provide me, why, 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 why is it happening? And if he had raised this particular issue, the risk would have been mitigated. Unfortunately, nobody raised that particular issue. And ultimately, it turned out to be that there was no bank balance. And Mr. Raju had to confess that whatever bank balances we have shown, that bank balance does not exist. There was no need for Raju to confess. The audit committee chairman, the audit committee itself could have very well found out that there is no bank balance because what was happening was virtually known through the facts which are being put up to the audit committee. But unfortunately, what has been happening is we all have been talking of only one thing and that is the auditor in inverted commas. So what were the auditors doing? There are four pillars of corporate governance, if you ask me. One pillar is auditor. Only one of the pillars is auditor. The other pillars are whom? There are shareholders, there are directors, there are regulators, and then the auditors. Unfortunately, no other pillar of the governance has been blamed for it, if you ask me. In the entire country today, and I think the world over the phenomenon could be the same, except now in India, the class action suits have come in because that will ensure now compliance through the governance. People are now running the risk. If you don't govern, then you will be hauled up somewhere else. Earlier, we had the basis in which there was absolutely no liabilities attached to you. You could jolly well become an independent director, still get away with the murders. I think that's not going to happen anymore. And now probably it is the GC or GRC which I am talking of is going to be the hallmark. 
I, 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 I can tell you about the other in institution and it's, it's common in the banks also. It's common world over. After all, why did Lehman Brothers happen? Lehman Brothers, if someone has to analyze, has to happen, had to happen or certain other failures had to happen because of one reason, if the audit committee fails and the board fails to recognize one particular fact, that there is a great risk attached, if you link the profits of the senior management with the profits earned by the company, then the revenue recognition is going to fail. Whatever we may try, whatever accounting standard we may pronounce, in that particular case there will be always a temptation to book the revenues which should not be booked. After all, what has happened in Tesco now? What happened in Reebok? The same things have happened. In Reebok, despite all the standards with regard to revenue recognition, I can, because I, I can tell you, there have been mails from German saying certain things which cannot be quoted here. But that is very clear that you wanted certain profits to be shown because the bonuses, the commissions of the top people were linked with the turnover. Now if you do this, then you leave the compliances somewhere else. Then there is no governance at all, unfortunately. I can tell you of another company without naming it. There was a insinuation against them that they have bribed the Indian officials to get the orders, to get, procure the orders. Now, when one went into the details thereof, I am telling you where we fail, where we, the board fails, where the audit committee fails, where the auditors fail altogether. Because if you want to create the value for money, for anybody, in that, in that case it is essential that all these pillars must work in, I, I, I can say, together. If they don't work together, the things are going to be bad. Now, in that particular case, the insinuation was that the company had paid bribes to the government officials to get the orders. The investigators came out with wonderful facts. What was happening in the company was, and that's a known accounting treatment. There's absolutely nothing wrong in that accounting, if you ask me. In various companies, there is a concept of IOU. You put in a slip, you take the cash, and then you are supposed to give the account. Rather than being debited to the impressed account straight away, for some time it may continue to be shown as a part, part of the cash. But now the cash amount was really huge under the IOUs. Internal auditors, year after year, quarter after quarter, kept on writing two lines. And I can't see how those lines can be written and how the audit committee can ignore those two lines. They kept on writing, substantial amount of IOUs have been outstanding for a substantial period of time. Now you ask somebody, what is meaning of substantial? 5%, 10%, kitna? How much you are willing to talk to? And how much period is substantial? Is it one month? Is it seven days? Is it three months? It is one year? How much is substantial? Absolutely no mention thereof. And the audit committee never raised this particular issue, believe me. In the entire audit committee, this question was never raised. The CFO of the company in one of the audit committee meetings reports that 18 crores worth assets are missing. No questions raised. I am only giving one of the examples. But so far as this IOU business is concerned, if you go to the cash books of the various branches, in the cash books of the various branches, on the top of, us, top of it was written, before the cash balance, IOU this much, and in bracket UTT. And when the investigator found out what this UTT means, the people replied under the table transaction. <laughs> this is all mentioned on the face of the cash books, believe me. 
and if the statutory auditor, internal auditor, audit committee and the board does not take notice of this, in the Companies Act of India now, it is said, the books of accounts will not be considered to be maintained on electronic mode if there is any alteration possible in the books of accounts. I think well said, there is no doubt about it. Because you could not take the shelter that these are maintained on electronic mode. There are number of changes which have come as a consequence of one particular or two particular cases so far as the Companies Act is concerned, friends. Let me also say that in some of the cases, what has been happening is, one has gone through, sitting on the boards of the various uh, companies or banks or insurance companies, that one felt that where we are as an independent director, what we are trying to do, and if we can't even find out, in the case of banks, believe me, I, I think this could be the phenomenon everywhere also. We might have very genuine reasons of saying certain things, but then how the assets have been impaired, how the um, financial instruments have been impaired, I don't want to comment upon that. Firstly, how the advances are given. Policies are always there. Now, people talk of one thing and they, they talk of one thing very passionately that we have got internal control systems. Well said, no doubt about it. But what is important is whether those internal control systems, whether financial or operating, are operating efficiently and are really having the efficacy. Where is that comment? That comment is missing. At least in US, the moment it happened in the case of Enron, they came up with the Sarban Oxley Act. We have lived in our country without any framework for the internal control systems. Now, in the Companies Act under Section 143, what has been asked for from the auditor is, please comment, because to, in the morning somebody said something, I am coming back to this. He has been asked to comment upon the efficiency and the efficacy of the internal control systems without having a framework in the country, how to judge it. Now the institute was told by the government, you come up with some guidance note, we have come up with the guidance note. Now this has been deferred by one year, but the directors are still supposed to comment upon it and that has not been extended by one year without having a framework. So who becomes liable? We do not have any system whereby we can really judge the efficiency or efficacy of the internal control systems. We might can, because we need to have a framework for that. COSO framework we are not willing to implement for one reason or the other. But what I am trying to tell you is that somewhere or the other this GRC has taken some kind of a backseat in some of the institutions. And when it comes to the other countries also, I, 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 I can share with you because one of the companies in the country, now I am going to share another example with you of perfect corporate governance, what I can call of. United Spirits Limited, you know the promoter, very honest, <laughs> honest to the core, willing to repay any of the borrowings to the bankers without even uh, thinking about it. The auditors have commented this year, till last time there was some other audit firm. This time there is a change of the auditors. And the auditors have commented, I, my, I must say my hats off to them. The auditors have commented that we have got the external confirmations done. They have to get it done under SA 505. They have absolutely no choice about it. And the parties have confirmed to us that they are repaid this particular amount at the instance of the company management to the other group companies in the earlier years. And they say that if you want this money back in this particular company, first repay us through those group companies and then we will repay your amount in this particular company. 
Now, someone should have taken cognizance of this in the earlier years also. Based upon this, these external confirmations, the management has very conveniently provided for thousands of crores of rupees this year. Thousands of crores, not uh, lakhs, of, thousands of crores of rupees this year, and saying that this matter is under investigation. Now, if this matter is under investigation, at least the auditor had one duty to perform. There is an SF 240 on frauds. He should have gone into that also. And then, under our Caro, because uh, I, I think someone referred to Caro or Mao Caro in the morning. Mao Caro to bhai nahi, because Mao is dead all over the world. Maoism is dead. We have come to Karo because we tell the auditor kuch to karo. Let's do something <laughs> about it. Now, when it comes to Karo, in Karo there is a clause 21. And clause 21 says if any fraud has been noticed or reported by or on the management, the auditor must bring it out. Auditor says this so far as the external confirmation part is concerned, but fails to mention in the Karo that the management has committed a fraud. If the employee commits a fraud, then you will always mention. But if the management commits a fraud, who will mention? I think this is not compliance. This is absolutely no compliance, and the audit committee shouldn't have left the auditor. Auditor. Rather, the audit committee should have told him when the draft report was given, please mention it in your clause 21 also. After all, the audit committee is being headed by an independent director. If an independent director does not remain independent, then there is a problem area. So, and no compliance through the governance will be feasible unless someone is an independent director. And there is a classic case of a listed entity in which the barber of the promoter is a listed entity. I'm, I'm, whatever I say, I stand by every word of it. Let me be very clear about it. Barber of the promoter has been inducted as an independent director, as an independent director on the board. <laughs> and in the qualifications and experience, it has been mentioned personality maker. Now, if you affect compliance through governance with, with these kind of independent directors, I think it's a million, million dollar question. See, the accounting standards will help us. IFRS will definitely help us. There is no doubt in my mind. I've, after all, to me, why the accounting standards are required for the governance purposes? Because this leads to disclosures. The disclosures which are required these leads to disclosure of the accounting policies which make the account various financial statements comparable. These lead to greater transparency for that particular matter. These lead to faster provisioning wherever provisioning is required. These lead to estimations and judgments based upon certain principles. There's no doubt about it. All, the, all these IFRS are based upon that. If you look at the financial instruments today, they talk of even a collateral security to be pledged or re-pledged. The details thereof. The moment you re-pledge, the details thereof have to be given. If a collateral security can be taken back by somebody, which I, according to me, anybody can take away collateral security, or the entire details have to be mentioned therein. Now, these disclosures are absolutely fine. There is no doubt about it. But I have been talking, and I have been saying in the Nakas also, believe me, what is going to be the cost of overburdening of the financial statement with all these disclosures, which nobody is going to read? You look at the disclosures that we make for the retirement benefits, or uh, sorry, employee benefits. You give everything. You give the actuarial valuations, his assumptions, his presumptions. What you don't give, past service cost, the interest at which the discounting has been done. You give everything, but somebody has to understand and then only apply that. And what is happening is that the financial statements will run into 10 pages, but the disclosures will be running into 200 pages in every company in the periods to come. 
IFRS will definitely make two industries very happy, the paper industry and the printing industry. There is no doubt in my mind. Despite the fact that I happen to be the chairman of NACAS, I still feel that we need to do something and I am told that IESB has undertaken a project now. How to reduce these, uh, uh, the overload of the disclosures? Because disclosures are fine everywhere, there is no doubt about it. And now, even our schedule 2, which is newly with regard to the depreciation, because worldwide as that is the phenomenon earlier, we were very clear and no audit committee was bothered at least on that particular aspect that if the rates of depreciation have been prescribed and the schedule to the Companies Act, you cannot charge a depreciation lower than that. But that was illogical, there is no doubt about it. That was definitely illogical. And now in the schedule 2, the clarification has been given because now what has been given in schedule 2 because when we decided to embark upon the path of the IFRS implementation, we said that the rates of depreciation cannot be given by the schedule because then it becomes rule based whereas the IFRS are all principle based. You know under no circumstances you can give the rates of depreciation. Now what has been prescribed or given after lot of discussions with the different industries by the schedule 2 is the useful estimated useful life of the various assets. And now it says the schedule 2, the, the clarification has been given by the government that to at our instance that the useful life of the asset can be more or less than what has been mentioned in the schedule 2. But it should be supported by a technical estimate. I think that is fair enough. But that I also know, you would also be very clear that gives somebody a room for a game play. There is no doubt about it. Believe me, in some of the cases like investment property, we have denied the option to fair value. We said that we will not give that option because if we give that option, probably the entire thing will be taken to the profit and loss and uh, we do not want that thing to happen at least in the country because our law system is very defective. Because once the case starts, when it is going to end, nobody knows. Mr. Raghu in the morning, the pre president informed that we have finished off all the cases so far as Satyam is concerned and I know with how much difficulty we could do it. We had to fight every case in the court of law to get the stay vacated and we have paid through our nose basically to the various lawyers to get that stay vacated. But then their cases in the other courts are still pending and will continue to be pending till the lifetime of Mr. Raju for that matter, I can tell you that. So, we, we, we have our own problems. What I am trying to tell you is, we have the standards on impairment, we have the standards on provisioning. Now, impairment is one standard, if you ask me, what you are doing, after all, if, if the audit committee chairman does not understand what is the meaning, actual meaning of the impairment, because it only says that he should be financially literate. It does not say that he has to be a chartered accountant. And financial literate means that he knows only what is on the right side of the balance sheet and what is on the left side of the balance sheet. He will still be considered to be financially literate. And people say that in the various balance sheets, what is there on the right side is not left and what is on the left side is not right about it basically. So, that is what people have been saying for any number of years that what is on the right side is not left and what is on the left is not right very frankly. So, I think when it comes to impairment you will be preparing a projection, you will be calculating the economic life of the asset, you will be calculating whether it will really generate that kind of revenue, then you will compare it with the economy, the present value of the entire asset. In that case, what is going to happen? Whether that impairment will occur or will not occur, it is a different matter. I can tell you, at least my oil and gas experience is absolutely different and I, I can talk of it worldwide more or less. At what particular point of time they impair their wells? I think it is anybody's guess. You keep on drilling you and you say it is successful method, it is Flana method, it is any method. 
but whether these are really impaired in time or not. Or you keep on saying that these much reserves do exist in the oil wells. I think this is not a governance. I think you will continue to have the accounting standards. You will continue to have the IFRS. To me, that's not important. To me, what is important is how these accounting standards are implemented by the audit committee and taken to the board for that particular matter. My only suggestion has been all through that board has to control, but board must uphold the responsibility for governing on an overall basis. And the audit committee must uphold its responsibility for really taking, looking at the sound accounting principles and the reporting systems, the internal control systems for that matter, and looking at it whether these really meet the requirement of identification of risks, measurement of risks, mitigation of risks. And if it cannot do it, there is absolutely no point in having that kind of a committee. And when it comes to the external auditors, my only comment is that the external auditor must uphold its responsibility for really commenting upon what he feels to be true and fair. And he must stay away from the other assignments of consultancy, etc., etc. Unless he does that, nothing is going to happen. I can only tell you, because this is one of the major points of governance, if you ask me. And if we want to comply and also govern at the same time, external auditors should be not undertaking. And I think the time is reaching very fast. That particular point where people will have to decide whether I have to go to the auditing profession or some other matter. You cannot continue to be the auditor and a consultant to the same organization. I think we have done a fantastic job so far as Companies Act is concerned under section 144 now in the new act, where it says that directly or indirectly, you cannot have any other assignment virtually. That's the position which has been carved out for the statutory auditors. And it goes on to even make it a point to say that even if you are under the same brand, you know why it has been said. Even if you are under the same brand, you will not be able to do it. You cannot do it that you form a private limited company, you still continue to be a part of the brand of the same company, and on the other side, you keep on acting as the statutory auditors also of the company. That's not possible. Neither you can do internal audit, nor you can do any management consultancy, nor you can design their internal control system, nor you can comment upon their internal control systems, because the entire independence of the auditor is impaired is, or, or is jeopardized in that particular case. I think on certain matters, the new company law has moved very fast and that is, has done a good job, if you ask me. But on the other matters of it, I personally feel uh, pretty threatened that some of the provisions are totally illogical. But when you talk of illogical or illegal, it is very difficult to define. Because uh, one of the students was failed by the teacher and he went to him. He said, how could you fail me? He said, you failed and I have failed you. He said, no, let us enter into an agreement. I will ask you a question, three questions I will ask you. If you answer all the three questions, then you fail me. If you are unable to answer my questions, then you have to pass me. And he asked him the questions. He said, what is legal but illogical? What is illogical but legal? What is, sorry, what is, in the first instance he asked, what is legal but illogical? In the second instance he asked, what is logical but illegal? And thirdly, what is illogical as well as illegal? No, the teacher couldn't answer that particular question. So he perforce had to pass this particular student. And the teacher with sense of pride in the next morning went to the class and asked everybody, 50 students the question, please answer these three questions. And everybody raised the hands. And he was surprised. So he asked one of the students, he said, sir, if a teacher at the age of 60 marries a girl of 20, it is legal but illogical. <laughs> and if his wife enters into some kind of an affair with one of the students of a similar age, it is logical but illegal. And if that teacher passes the same student, 
it is neither logical nor <laughs> legal. So some of the provisions, so some of the provisions which have been made out under the law seem to be baffling, those seem to be absolutely illogical and at times you feel that these may be even contravening the basic intention. Some of the, we are framing some of the rules under the Companies Act which are absolutely different from the main section for that matter. I, I don't want to waste your time but I can tell you that. That is why I said that some of the things can be illegal also. Another point that I would like to say is to me what is compliance through the governance most important is the related party transaction. We have a standard on that. Unfortunately or fortunately we have a standard. IFRS defines a relative differently. Our standard defines it differently. Our standard naturally because of our own values talks of father, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter and spouse. I think when we were preparing the accounting standards we were never influenced by the Ekta Kapoor serials. <laughs> Otherwise we could have said spouses for that matter. So we were only influenced by our normal family considerations that in Indian society what happened. But if you read IFRS which we are finding difficult to implement, it says instead of the, there is no use of the word spouse, it says domestic partner. <laughs> then it goes on to say your children, children of domestic partner and children of both. <laughs> no, this is, but the standard we have to live with, that is on the lighter side of it. Now what has happened is, why, why we are facing the difficulty but what I am trying to signify to you is the importance of the related party transaction standard. The audit committee has to make sure. In the Companies Act now it has come under 188 for that matter and I think this is the position world over to my mind because you have to be very very clear what are the related party transactions and how do you deal with those related party transactions with that, whether these are with the holdings and subsidiaries or these are with your joint ventures or these are with your associates with whomsoever these transactions are there. You have to take care of that particular matter. Now what has happened is that our a Companies Act defines a relative dif related party differently, relative differently than whatever accounting standard defines it as. Now what governance the audit committee has to look at, I, I think they will definitely try to look at Companies Act first because Companies Act definition of relative is broader. They include some in laws also. We thought while framing the accounting standard that laws are very difficult, in laws are the most complex of the law. <laughs> so we excluded so far as the laws were concerned. We said you don't deal with your mother, deal with mother-in-law. You will not be reported as a related party transaction. You don't deal with father, deal with father-in-law, you will not be re reported as a related party transaction. Reporting of the related party transactions is the most important aspect to me because there are transfer pricing issues. It is another matter today that our own government would say that Vodafone, no appeal is to be filed against Vodafone or someone else for that matter. But the fact remains that if you don't want to really challenge the transfer pricing, whether whatever you have said in the Companies Act or in the accounting standards, what is going to matter? I think the most important aspect is whatever are your transactions with the related parties, the transfer pricing issues are there. Whether you divert profit from one to another or you divert certain expenses from one to another, something is definitely happening and you want to reach whether it is an arm length transaction or not. Audit committee in the periods to come in India and the board will be definitely burdened with the task of looking at the related party transaction and if they do not do it. I can tell you we are going to run into severe problems so far as the board members and the audit committee members are concerned. Because the related, the, it has very clearly said that it needs to be arm's length but then there are certain other disclosures which have been required to be made. I am I'm, I'm trying to touch only. But then another aspect that I would like to say about the accounting standards is which the um, audit committee and the board should be looking at that is the concept of the operating segments. Because there is a standard very clearly on that and I can tell you if you look at the balance sheet of ITC about 6 years back, the position of ITC was 
that the gigantic projects that they have in the name, name, name of the hotels, etc., 85% of their profitability comes from a product on which the package of which is written cigarette smoking is injurious to health. In the case of SSI, which was supposed to impart training to the people and which was supposed to prepare the software for the people, in their case, both these segments were in losses and yet the company was in profit. I think better than this cannot be an indicator to the audit committee or to the board what is happening from where these profitabilities are coming, whether these are coming through the interest or the commission or any other thing, I don't want to get into the details thereof. But the fact remains, if we want to comply through the governance, I think certain tough decisions are required. And if we don't take the tough decisions, I don't know where do we reach. I would like to conclude because I know what has been held before me. I will only like to say there is nothing like that, that it cannot happen in our company. You cannot say that. It can happen anywhere in any company, in any organization at any point of time for that matter. You can never be so sure. This is what was being said in the morning by Chetanji. And I can dare say today the three or four speakers that uh, I have heard today are absolutely par excellence. And I have never seen this kind of deliberation earlier. I, I can tell. And my all hats off to them. <laughs> Whatever uh, Steesh Mondras did, fabulous. Chetan did was absolutely fabulous. Raghu, simply superb. I, I, I can tell you it has been a great exercise listening to all these people all, all this morning. So what I was trying to say, also if it did not happen in past, it cannot happen. No. Rather, there is a greater chance because you are resting under those past laurels that it, can, it has not happened in my company, it will not happen. It gives somebody a rather handle that you are so overconfident that it will not happen so that he will like to do it. And particularly with the technological changes. In the entire banking today, the number of frauds have gone up. Like anything, at least I will not say number of frauds, but the quantum of frauds has gone up like anything because people have not been trained to that. People don't even use the systems. The kind of employees that we have in some of the banking, forget about the private sector, but so far as the public sector banks are concerned, I think the kind of frauds which, have, which are taking place, because there is no enough of training, the people have not been trained to use those systems. People who are being recruited are not actually trained in those systems. So what, what do I do? And I continue to feel since there has not been no fraud, so it will, there will be no fraud so far as this particular issue is concerned. There is an ever-changing environment of business, need to diversify, technological changes, and of course the ever-increasing greed of the human being. And unless we comply to govern, the things will become only worse in the periods to come. Friends, thanks a lot for a very, very patient hearing. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Too. Thank you, sir. So one hour is just too short for us to get the benefit of, you know, of your knowledge. So I think it's only each time you're on dais, you just leave us in awe and yearning for more. So I think in the next possible opportunity, I think it would only be fair if we have a few more hours with you, or at least I should say a couple of more days, because even hours would be very little. I have a time, I think, only for a quick couple of questions here. So this is the first one. It's an unfortunate fact that UTTs exist and that the management and board and even the shareholders are aware of it. So how should we as accountants and auditors, what should we be doing in such scenarios? You see, it's probably to me this is the most difficult question to answer. But I can dare say someone or the other will have to bell the cat one day. There are countries where there are laws that you cannot bribe. There's no doubt about it. And there probably this thing doesn't exist. 
but then there are countries where the laws are there, but then continue the things continue to happen. We have the maximum laws with the maximum violations. We are the only country with the anti dowry law with the maximum dowry deaths if you ask me. I think some person with a flag will have to someone will have to raise that particular flag and say no I have to report. Otherwise the banks will not find them beset it with a non performing accounts of 4,75,000 crores. And believe me whatever restructured amounts are there in the country 60 percent of that amount is not going to come back to the banks under any circumstances. Whatever assessments we are having with regard to our total NPS, whatever assessments we are having to the shortfall in the capital adequacy of the banks in the periods to come and meeting the Basel III requirements, I think that is not going to happen. Because if I just keep on allocating 14,000 crore, 20,000 crore rupees, we are requirement runs into 6 lakh or 6